Cochrane doesn't make recommendations. That is an absolute rule. Sometimes, historically, Cochrane authors made recommendations when they shouldn't have done. But systematic reviews do not give recommendations. And the reason for that is they're just often put together by methodologists and treatment decisions should be made taking into consideration the evidence alongside the expertise of the professionals and the values and preferences of the patient or the community. So we don't, well, we often do have content people, but we don't make recommendations. If you look at the text of this review, it looks like a recommendation, I accept that. But this was a review written first time in about 1999. Actually, it was written long before that, but this data were 1999. And uh, it hasn't really been changed since. It's sort of a historical thing. And if you look at the data, it is sort of interesting. So this is motor function at six weeks, I hope. Six months and a year in all patients. And as you can see, if we were, in, really, if we were really uh, influenced too much by statistical significance, which I always try not to be, you'd say no effect, right? This is um, patients treated in the first eight hours. And it hasn't come across, but this side benefits uh, methylphenidate, and this side, but there's no treatment. Sorry, methylprednisolone, sorry. You know. It's a long day. And this is no treatment, right? So, so you look at that in the first eight hours and you go, blimey. But it's standard, medi it's me it's standard mean deviations and that's quite hard. But I'm just going to leave that with you. We'll come back to my presentation in a second. So, um, asked for about to the low but risk of... But this is all... But, so as you see, this is a single author. We shouldn't have... No systematic review should have a single author these days. And the single author, Michael Bracken, who is a very respected epidemiologist, and nothing I say this today is in any sense a criticism of him for doing something that at the time was completely re reasonable. Um, he wrote the review, and of course his was the, main, the study that mainly influenced the outcome. Okay, so we've all got that. And he says that there was low risk of bias. Now, I don't think there were many studies done in 1997, 98 that we would now regard as low risk of bias. But at the time, and this, by the way, for interest, oh, sorry. Is the mortality data. Um, and he, and because he was over, in, because at the time, Professor Bracken was interested in statistical significance, he said, well, it doesn't make any difference for mortality. Well, hang on a minute. If you look at this, the relative risk for mortality in these three studies looks like it consist, substantially favours uh, the steroid. Well, that's weird, isn't it? So are we saying that steroids reduce mortality in ne acute neck injury? Well, we'll come back to it, won't we? But if you had just in passing, you'd notice the relative risk of 0.54 which would generally be thought to be a rather important difference, if true, and I'm not suggesting it is. But actually, that's a reduction of 5.6% to 3%. I just worked it out. I hope I got it right. Okay, so just to bear in mind, as we go through my presentation, those rather curious data. So I'm here to talk about living guidelines. Um, I'm, my name is David Tovey. I'm editor in chief at Cochrane. Uh, this lecture should have been given by Julian Elliott uh, from Melbourne. Um, he didn't know anything about the, the Bracken review, so you'd have, got, you'd have missed that bit. Um, right, declaration of interest. I'm fully paid a member of Cochrane, so if I sound defensive, that's uh, just a contractual obligation. I wasn't trying to. Uh, and for people who aren't familiar with Cochrane, Cochrane is a global uh, charity, not-for-profit, comprising 37,000 people. Um, and our mission is to promote evidence-based, uh, evidence-informed decision-making uh, by producing high-quality, accessible, systematic reviews. And this is the Cochrane Library. And if you... Uh, and, and we now have 7,110 active reviews and over 2,000 protocols. We produce about 1,000 new or updated reviews a year. 
And if you look for traumatic brain injury, you find that we have around um, 61 active reviews, 46 active reviews. My slides are now saying completely different things. Um, and about 2,000 trials. Now, this slide was produced by the Institute of Medicine for its work in 2011, looking at how you tell whether treatments work. And it sort of describes what we would, what the sort of ideal world situation. So you have a clinical problem defined at about 10 o'clock on the slide. You have people getting together saying, you know, we need better evidence to guide our choices. You then assemble a team that knows what they're doing to, do a, to conduct a systematic review, looking at all the evidence, trying to pull all that together. They identify, assess, synthesize the evidence, produce their report. That then goes through to the guidelines body, um, and the guidelines body looks at that, looks at the evidence, looks at the uh, health professionals' views, looks at the uh, patient views, thinks about its local surroundings, about cost and context and all those things. Remembering, just going back to the last presentation, evidence is global, uh, guidelines are very local. So you have to, your guidelines have to be rethought in your own context. They do, you do all that, and then you decide on some recommendations, and you uh, bring these to the bedside. So that is, that is um, the ideal world situation. Um, but we know it's not really quite working. And why is it not working? For a number of reasons. One is that we're increasingly looking at evidence and worrying about the uh, different causes of bias and waste and all the other things that can go wrong uh, in terms of internal validity and applicability. Uh, guidelines bodies always need evidence much quicker than it can be produced. Um, interesting, uh, listening to all the presentations this afternoon, my head was spinning a bit. Uh, great, a lot of interest now in real-world data and thinking about how real-world data plays into all of this. Non-randomized studies, how do we assess bias, how do we look at, uh, looking at how, how do we make that predictable? Um, thinking about more complex questions. Um, you know, this afternoon, I think, uh, has shown the, uh, that in, in, in very much. And also thinking about how we move from a, a, a view of looking at populations to looking at individualized or personalized, or I think Barack Obama called it precision medicine. So I've got three um, offers of help uh, at hand. The first one is technology. Now this is a Cochrane tool built by James Thomas at the uh, at UCL in London. And this looks at how you identify studies using technology. And he, James and his team have now built a tool that if you throw in a stack full of references and, uh, and PDFs, they can then work, the machine can work out with around 99% accuracy which are, trial, which are likely to be trials and which are not likely to be trials. That would potentially cut out a ton of work in uh, assessing the evidence. It can also, um, there's also technology now that can pull out the PICO data, the population interventions, comparisons, and outcomes, and indeed also risk of bias. So again, the machines are threatening, are threatening, are offering to do a lot of the legwork for people doing uh, systematic reviews. And also on this slide, we add in the use of the crowd. We've had a pro we have a crowd platform that we use to also get, to get the crowd to identify studies and as you can see here, it's been reasonably successful, attracting 7,000, almost 7,000 volunteers, people getting nothing for this. 120 countries have categorized over almost one and a half million studies. So help number two, and I want you to think back to the Bracken review, because I want to talk about grade. Grade didn't exist in 1999, although I think the grade working group were just coming together, maybe about that time. So, why, are, why is grade useful? Grade is useful because instead of, in comparison with other quality measure, ways of measuring study quality, it doesn't just look at individual studies, it looks at outcomes across studies. So if you go back to the Bracken, study, uh, the Bracken review and look at those studies, and think about the quality, or what we would now call the certainty of that body of evidence. You may want to think about how it would have played out if, we'd, if it had been put through that filter. So it's not study-based, 
It's intuitive and flexible. In, one, in previous iterations of quality measures, people always thought that a randomized trial was going to be superior to a non-randomized study. Now, you, this afternoon, are already hearing about the use of big data. And non-randomized studies are often very big. Big data is, you know, by many leagues, bigger. And so it may well be that in many cases, observational studies give higher quality evidence than randomized studies. It allows you to make that judgment. It also allows you to think about communication. So it makes you think about your harms. It puts it together relative and absolute effects. So you don't just think about a relative risk of 0.64 and think that's, or 0.54, or whatever it was, and think that's fantastic. Just think about the absolute effect as well. It, look, it thinks about things in terms of certainty, and it helps you write better sentences. Instead of saying this treatment's effective, you need to think about, well, what's the certainty? And I would say, uh, as a theme of this afternoon, you know, when, when you look at, we look at data, what's the certainty that that's right? And here's an example of a grade table, uh, and I know these look pretty daunting when you first look at them, but I promise you that if somebody asks you to comment on a systematic review and gives you 10 minutes notice, which the BBC has done to me twice, this helps. So really I was here to talk about living systematic reviews and guidelines. Um, and what this is about, Cochrane updates its reviews um, to the best of its ability. Um, but that's t it tends to take a long time. It tends to be about five years, three years. That's often too long. People want to know if new data comes along, are you putting it in straight away? Well, there are methodology challenges about that, but you don't want to know that. But and, uh, we ha we've now created these living systematic reviews, which aim as evidence comes around, data becomes available. It may not be a published paper. It may be a something on clinicaltrials.gov. It gets put straight into the review. And these are our two northern no, hospitals. These are the two examples of, the, uh, of reviews that we've put into a position where when data comes and we know it's coming because of the trials registers, we put it straight into the review. Um, evidence to decision tables are another way of, use, of, of using GRADE to try and help the guideline panel make judgments about benefits and harms, cost, feasibility, how important is this harm against this benefit, how do you make those judgments? How do populations make those judgments? Um, and, and all this sort of implementation factors that a guideline has to, board has to take into consideration. And that leads you to come for one of four recommendations. One is a strong recommendation to treat, one is the intervention, one is a strong recommendation not to treat, and in the middle you have the judgment calls. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. Some people would choose this, some people would choose the other, and so on. Stop looking at my screen. Living guidelines are on the same basis. You create your guideline and you set out from the outset to incorporate new evidence or other things changing. Drugs may be taken off the market. You can't use that anymore. What are you going to do? Um, and to keep the guideline constantly up to date. Ellie Ackel, who's done some, a lot of work on this in, uh, in Beirut, uh, has said, but in order to do this, you need a lot of things in place. You need your systematic reviews, but you need also your evidence panel to be available to make the judgments, a peer review process, a publication, coordination, and you need budget. Again, technology can help. This is a, a magic tool, the magic tool, which was built in on Oslo in Norway, and aims to help guideline bodies make judgments by pulling the evidence together and uh, teasing out how you would make choices about which are the important outcomes, benefits, and harms, and, how, and which, which people would lean towards one recommendation, which another, helps you to make a recommendation. Uh, and that's been sh uh, shown in the uh, BMJ's Rapid Rex series, which uh, works where the people have worked with NICE and people from McMaster to pull together very rapid evidence reviews, less than uh, three or four months, beginning to end, and aiming to match that with a guideline process, bringing in all the other perspectives, health professionals, patients, the uh, uh, carers, and so on. So, um, these are changing times for evidence. The, you know, the traditional ways of looking at evidence and evidence-based guidelines, I think, are beginning to shift on the, for reasons I said earlier. Technology is our friend. It's helping us to both generate evidence and also translate it for end users. Uh, we'll be looking at different forms of authorship in the future, things like the crowd, 
you know, how do you give credit to all those people that helped the, with the crowd? And finally, living systematic reviews may be one way of uh, getting over the problem of, of, uh, of guidelines produced in very good faith, often very uh, sophisticated methods, falling rapidly out of date and being very difficult to update. So that's, that's where I stop. I'm very happy to uh, take questions, but if you go back to the Bracken thing, you just you have to think, how would you have graded that evidence? That evidence would have come out as low or very low. What's really interesting, I think, as a non-neurosurgeon, in front of neurosurgeons, as far as I know, who don't have guns, um, is that nobody ever replicated that study, those studies. Now, it's really interesting that, how many it's now? It's almost 20 years ago, and nobody looked at those studies again. And my guess is, like so many things in medicine, in the, the initial studies would have turned, were positive, we know that, or looking positive, and, the, and replicant studies would have shown less and less effect, probably null effect, and the effect estimate would have been pulled over time back to zero. But we'll probably never know, because my guess is nobody's ever going to do that study again. Thank you.